Um, so my name is Liz Prada da Costa. I am a pediatric dentist, and I'll be talking to you a little bit about my experience in the field of dentistry. Um, the topic of the, of the presentation is diversity in dentistry, but I want to emphasize that I'm obviously one person um, in a very, very large field. Um, so just take that with a grain of salt. Everything that I say is, um, you know, my experience through my lens of life. Uh, I work at the Lancaster Clough Palette Clinic, which is a nonprofit clinic in Lancaster City. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later as well and the work that we do at our facility. So who am I? Um, I am one of about 200,000 dentists licensed to practice in the United States. The picture to the right is of my husband, Victor, and my two little boys, Mark and Evan. Um, so job number one in my life is as a mommy. I mentioned earlier that I'm a pediatric dentist and there are about 6,000 pediatric dentists in the US and we're growing annually. So it's a very popular field. Um, we obviously treat children and we focus mainly on children with extensive dental disease and those with special health care needs. I'm a public health professional as well. So I hold both a dental degree and a master's degree in public health. And my concentration within public health is healthcare management and administration. Um, I'm obviously very interested in health disparities and looking at dentistry from the perspective of a population and not just a one-on-one -on -one relationship between the provider and the patient. I mentioned that I'm the executive director of the nonprofit Lancaster Cleft Palate Clinic. And what we do is that we provide multi-specialty care for children born with cleft lip and cleft palate. I've been lucky enough to have tremendous educational opportunity um, that's taken me to where I am now in life. So I started out my undergraduate education at Duke University, and I received a bachelor's degree there in biology and public policy. From there, I attended the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine, which is located in Philadelphia. Um, we serve patients mainly in the West Philadelphia area. And from there, I went on to specialty training at UNC Chapel Hill in North Carolina. There, I pursued a residency program in pediatric dentistry and also completed my master's in public health degree. So why is the topic of diversity important to me? Um, generally speaking, women are quite underrepresented in the field, and we'll get into specifics a little bit later about that. Um, with my personal experience, I come from a very culturally diverse family. My father was born and raised in South America, specifically in Colombia. His first language is Spanish, and he immigrated to the United States in the 1970s. And the reason that he did that was to pursue medical training in psychiatry. So as a result, I'm a first generation American. Um, my father obviously is a foreign trained physician, and a lot of that experience um, shaped my early childhood because he was going through his training, his residency, his fellowship, and early years in practice um, while I was growing up. So three of my four grandparents speak a language, spoke a language other than English growing up. So both of my father's parents obviously spoke Spanish, and my maternal grandfather grew up speaking German, and he was born and raised in South Dakota. So interestingly, despite all of this diversity, my family made a conscious effort to shield me from a lot of the diverse heritage that I have. And I always found this very strange and a little bit disconcerting growing up. You know, why were they doing this? Why weren't they embracing their heritage? And little by little, my dad would share snippets with me about his experience as a foreign trained physician. And what he said to me was that because he was born, raised, and trained in another country, he was seen as a second class citizen. So he faced a lot of discrimination, and as a result of that, wanted me to grow up as a quote-unquote American, specifically an English-speaking American without a Spanish accent. Um, so I do not speak Spanish. Um, I am not bilingual. I did take a little bit of Spanish in college, um, but I think that's something that is a huge loss uh, as a practitioner because I do see a large number of Hispanic patients and I think it's really important to be able to communicate effectively with the patients that you're, um, that you're treating. Um, another story that my dad shared with me, um, we used to attend a lot of uh, offsite continuing medical education conferences with him. So we'd travel to places like California or Florida growing up. And my mom and sister and I would do fun stuff while my dad would go to his CME courses. And one time when we were visiting California for a course, 
My dad went off site and on a taxi ride back to the hotel, his taxi driver didn't take him to the front of the hotel. He actually drove him around the rear and dropped him off at the service entrance. And that experience really stuck with him that because of the way that he looks, because of the way that he presents himself and because of the language and um, accent uh, situation that he was assumed to be a worker at the hotel as opposed to an attendee at a conference. So again, I think that fear of discrimination and that fear of being different really shaped the way that he chose to raise me. So as I mentioned, I work at the Lancaster Clough Pallet Clinic. Um, we were founded in 1938 and were the first clinic of our kind in the United States established to treat patients with craniofacial conditions. Annually, we care for about 2,500 patients. As I mentioned, we provide multidisciplinary medical and dental care across 13 different specialties. And our service area covers all of central Pennsylvania, eastern Pennsylvania, and Greene County in western Pennsylvania. Um, about one in 700 births in the United States um, results in a child born with a cleft lip, a cleft palate, or both. Interestingly, clefts are much more common in individuals of Asian descent and much less common in those of African descent. I think one of the strengths of our clinic is that we accept every patient who requires our services and who walks through our door, regardless of their insurance status or their ability to pay. Most of our surgical care is provided at Penn State Hershey at the Children's Hospital. Our clinic has a very strong relationship uh, specifically with the Department of Plastic Surgery. Um, three of the plastic surgeons in the department at Penn State actually donate their time to our clinic. And they visit us once a week, every Tuesday, and they host what's called a team day. And that's when all of our specialists get together and together we see all of our patients as a team. And so what that allows us to do is to coordinate treatment plans and communicate effectively um, so that we're providing the highest quality of care to our kids. I'm also on staff at Lancaster General Hospital. This is an image of the suburban outpatient pavilion at LGH, which is just off of Harrisburg Pike. And what I do at LGH at this particular facility is that I provide dental care under anesthesia for children with special health care needs. For example, if a young child who's two or three years old has a mouthful of cavities and they, they're, at, they're at a point in their life where they're um, uncooperative or unable to sit still for a dental procedure, I can treat them safely and effectively in a one to two hour long appointment while they're asleep under anesthesia. And so it really provides a tremendous service to, um, to young children and children with special needs so that they're not enduring multiple uncomfortable appointments with restraint in an office setting. So getting back to the topic of diversity, um, the American Dental Association has recently made a commitment to increasing diversity, not only in the, in the field of dentistry, but within their membership as well. And what they're realizing is that it's, um, it's really important to have a diverse set of dental practitioners, um, not only to, um, to increase cultural competency, but also it's important because a lot of us practice in communities that are similar to the area where we grew up. Um, so what they're looking to do is to increase uh, access to care in rural communities where there might not be a large number of dentists or dental specialists, and then within urban areas as well. Um, so my particular clinic, uh, the Clough Pallet Clinic, is located in the center of Lancaster City. And for those of you who know the city, um, we're right at Lyman Chestnut Street in the old historical district. And we're located in what's called a health professional shortage area. And so what that means is that relative to the general population, we have a lower number of dentists per capita than the United States as a whole. And so that actually is a really important designation because it provides access to certain resources for example, loan repayment and additional funding sources so that we're better, better able to, to treat our patients in our neighboring community. The picture on the right-hand side is of my co-residents and my colleagues from UNC Chapel Hill. So this particular image is of a lobby day in Washington, DC. So every year, the American Dental Association and the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry holds what's called lobby day. 
and dentists from all around the country travel to Washington, D.C. And what we do is we meet with our local um, representatives and our senators on Capitol Hill, and we talk about issues relevant to increasing access to care in dentistry. Um, I had a very diverse residency program, diverse faculty uh, within the program, and I think that made a huge impact upon the way that I choose to practice now. So what does the dental workforce look like as a whole? Um, so the first column on the left-hand side shows the ethnic and racial back, back, uh, breakdown of the United States as a whole. Um, so about 63% of Americans are of white or Caucasian background, about 6% are Asian, 13.5% come from uh, black heritage, 15.3% are of Hispanic or Latino or Latinx background, and about 4.2% are Native American, Pacific Islander, or of, or of mixed race or ethnicity. Now the dental workforce is much, much less diverse. Um, so there's an overrepresentation of dentists from a Caucasian background. Um, there's a slight overrepresentation in the Asian community among dentists, and then an underrepresentation in those of Black, Hispanic, or other background. And in Pennsylvania, that discrepancy is even larger. So I think we have a long way to go. In 2016, about 15% of applicants to dental school were underrepresented minorities. Um, so even among those who are applying currently, um, we, we have a long way to go in terms of increasing our diversity. And there's a bit of debate about why this is. Um, some hypothesize that it may be a lack of awareness of oral health careers. Um, there's a hypothesis of disadvantage in educational opportunity, both in elementary, high school, and undergraduate preparation. But I think one of the biggest deterrents is the extremely high cost of dental school. And we'll get into that in a bit. Um, but what I would recommend is that when you're looking at your healthcare profession um, going forward, don't be deterred by cost. You're really making an investment in your future. Um, there is no such thing as a dentist who's starving or having trouble putting food on the table. We're extremely well compensated and there's tremendous opportunity for loan repayment, um, scholarship programs, low interest loans, and so on to help with the cost of education. So really keep your eye on the prize and don't let that be a deterrent. 2016 and 2017, the average dental school debt among graduates um, increased from about $260,000 to in 2017, close to $290,000. Private schools are much more expensive, whereas public schools are a little bit less expensive. Um, I recently looked up the tuition and fees at the University of Pennsylvania where I went to dental school and their fee structure even exceeds the cost that you're seeing here. So um, dental school at Penn is about $110,000 a year. Again, keep in mind that that doesn't take into account scholarships um, and other opportunities. So again, as I mentioned, dentists are quite well compensated. They make anywhere from 107,000 to 208,000 for the middle 50% of dentists. And then specialists are in, generally speaking, the highest 25% of income earners. Dental specialists make anywhere from just over $280,000 a year to about $460,000 a year. So again, when you compare that to the investment that you're making into your education, the return on investment is, is more than justified. So my personal experience, um, I received a scholarship for underrepresented under minorities at Penn, and that helped to fund about 50% of the cost of my dental degree. Um, I was able to fund my master's in public health degree with a scholarship from the Hispanic Dental Association that was co-sponsored by Colgate Palmolive, and you'll recognize the name Colgate because they make many toothpastes. Um, I do hold federal student loans. The interest rate on my student loans right now is about 2.3%, so it's a very, very manageable monthly payment. I also took advantage of the opportunity to be a residential advisor while I was in dental school. So I lived in a freshman dorm and I was an RA, and that gave me the opportunity to have free room and board and also to be a mentor to younger students. Um, when I first went into practice, 
I, I worked at a community health department in Alamance County, North Carolina, which is in central North Carolina. And because I worked in that public health department, I was eligible for state loan repayment. So that's helped me to pay down the remainder of my debt. And I'm happy to report that right now I'm at the point where I could write a check tomorrow and pay off all of my student loans. And I have to say that that's a really empowering experience. Um, and it's also given me the opportunity to pursue somewhat of an alternative course in my education. So again, there's tremendous opportunity for meaningful career and to make a difference in dentistry. In terms of gender, um, the dental workforce is predominantly male, uh, but that is improving. Um, so about 70% of dentists nationwide are, are um, male, about a third are female. And in Pennsylvania, again, we have even more uh, progress to make. So about 73% of dentists are male. The good news is that currently about half of all dental school applicants are women. And in some schools, it's actually skewed as high as 60% female, 40% male. This is important because women are more likely to complete residency training, um, specifically in the areas of general or pediatric dentistry. They're more likely to treat children and they're more likely to participate in Medicaid and the child health insurance program. And those are insurances that um, are providing health care coverage for those of a lower socioeconomic status and um, those who have special health care needs. So that's a population that is in desperate need of um, qualified, competent uh, practitioners. Um, women are also mo more likely to come from an under underrepresented uh, background. Uh, the picture on my, on my right is of my dental school graduation. And of these four individuals, um, all of us work in pediatrics or orthodontics. So nationwide, um, slightly under 40% of dentists participate in Medicaid or CHIP or both. Um, the good news is that Pennsylvania, uh, that's closer to two thirds of the workforce. Um, now that's a bit of a deceiving number because in Pennsylvania, we have a number of Medicaid managed care organizations and not every dentist will participate in all of them. So you may have an office that participates in just CHIP. You may have an office that participates in two medical assistance plans. And so while this is good news that two thirds participate, again, we still have a ways to go. So how do you get into dental school? Um, study, 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 do well, and excel in your classes. Um, Pre-dental classes pretty much mirror uh, the, the dental class or the classes that you would take for pre-medical preparation as well. So if you're undecided about which way you want to go, uh, you know, you're, you're set up to go in any direction by taking biology, chemistry, biochemistry, physics, English, and then some advanced math classes. I would advise you to pursue leadership opportunities regardless of what your interests may be. Um, shadow and get hands-on experience and do well on the dental admissions test. I know under the current circumstances, it's a little bit more difficult to get shadowing experiences because some dentists are limiting the number of people in their office because of the COVID epidemic. Um, but at some point in the future, when we have a vaccine, when we achieve um, higher mask wear, you know, COVID will go away or it will get to a point where it's manageable at the community level. And those shadowing opportunities are going to open up again. So dental school is a four-year program. You'll obtain either a DMD, which is a doctor of dental medicine, or a DDS, doctor of dental surgery. And those degrees are really interchangeable. There's no difference in the course requirements or the licensure once you're out there. Um, the first and second year, you're really taking your building block courses, your basic science courses, and then you're also entering restorative dentistry lab where you're learning how to perform certain procedures. Third and fourth year, you're introduced to actually providing hands-on care for patients. So you'll rotate through the different specialties such as oral surgery, pediatrics, orthodontics, and you're taking more advanced clinical coursework. And then at my dental school in the fourth year, um, we were able to do honors experiences, which really gave us um, more advanced, almost residency-like experience in certain specialties. 
So what else do you need to do to become a dentist? As I said earlier, obviously excel in your coursework once you get into dental school. And the rest of it, not so relevant at your stage in life, but just be aware that there are national board exams to take. There are regional board exams to take. Some are written, some are on a computer, and some actually involve live interaction with a patient where you're providing um, actual procedures. Once you have your licensure, then you'll apply for malpractice insurance. And then you have to make the decision about whether or not you want to go directly into practice or whether you want to go into advanced specialty training, um, either, again, as I mentioned earlier, into one of the dental specialties or um, get more hospital-based experience in general dentistry. And that's what the general practice residency is. That's um, a one-year program as a PGY-1 in a hospital. And in that type of a program, you're providing uh, general dental care to med medically complex adult patients or an advanced education in general dentistry or AAGD, similar program, but those are based in dental schools as opposed to a hospital. To become a specialist, you're looking at about two to seven years of additional training in a residency program. And these are very similar to medical residencies. There's seven specialties um, and they're all phenomenal. Um, so I, again, I have dual specialty training in pediatrics and public health. Once you finish your training, then you have to decide how you're going to practice. And in dentistry, you have a multitude of options. I would say the majority of um, my colleagues started out out of training as associate dentists. And so what that means is that they became employees of somebody else's dental practice. Um, most associates eventually move on to ownership. So they'll practice for several years and then they'll either buy into a practice or buy out the previous owner and become co-owners or a sole owner in and of themselves. Dentists have the opportunity to be employed by a hospital. And again, you'll be taking care of those with um, more medically complex issues. Within public health, you can work within the Indian Health Service the National Health Service Corps. You can work in a federally qualified health center um, or community health department. There are also options in the military, specifically in the Air Force, the Navy, and the Army. Now, the military is great because it does provide loan repayment as well. And generally speaking, that's a year for a year. So if you provide a year of service to the military, they will pay back a year of your dental school in addition to salary and stipend. Um, so that's a very attractive option if you're inclined to consider military. So again, I mentioned I'm a pediatric dentist. Uh, most children are referred to me for extensive dental decay. I care for children who have dental anomalies such as missing teeth, extra teeth, genetic diseases. Um, I care for children who have behavioral management issues. And my autistic patients uh, most commonly fall into this category. Um, autism is a communicative disorder where children often have difficulty communicating um, and sometimes with their speech. And so interacting in a highly stimulating dental environment can often be a challenge. We also care for children and we consider growth and development as they age into adulthood. And then again, at our clinic, we care for children with craniofacial conditions such as cleft lip, cleft palate, and other genetic diseases that affect the structure of the head and neck. Dental decay is actually the most common chronic disease in children. Um, so when you think about what can impact the quality of life of a child, don't forget the mouth. Um, issues such as access to healthy food, um, access to fluoridated water, attitudes toward, toward oral hygiene at home and so on can all affect the oral health of a child. This is one of my patients that I actually treated under anesthesia in a hospital setting. Um, so as you can see, his upper and lower teeth were very, very badly damaged by very deep and extensive cavities. The black that you see in that image on the left-hand side is actually a treatment that we use to stop the progression of tooth decay. So we paint a liquid on the teeth 
for young and uncooperative children, and that's called silver diamine fluoride. And what that medicament does is that it actually precipitates silver into the tooth. And what that silver does is it acts very much like a dental filling to stop that decay from growing. That then buys the parent of the child time to address some of the other issues that are affecting oral health, such as diet, hygiene. They can work on uh, more effective brushing technique. They can work on avoiding things like juice, soda, and they can start to use um, certain topical treatments at home, like strong fluorides that help to further arrest or stop that dental decay. So even though the teeth look horrific in that first picture, if you look at the gum tissue, that child has a really clean mouth. And so that sets the stage for us to have an ideal restorative option when we go in there to fix the teeth. So the image on the right-hand side that you see is immediately post-op. Um, so that child's been under anesthesia for about an hour and a half, and what we've been able to do is to remove all of that decay and cover the teeth with a restoration or with a crown that then restores those teeth back to a more ideal form and function. I'm going, to, I'm going to get a little bit more into the details of what we do at my clinic. Um, so again, I'm not in a traditional private practice. Um, I do have the opportunity to work with a large number of specialists, again, both medical, dental, and allied health. So our clinic is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the quality of life of infants, children, and adults through comprehensive coordinated treatment of craniofacial conditions resulting from birth defects, trauma, and disease. And the woman that you see in that picture is our social worker. Um, so that she holds a very key role in our clinic um, because she bridges the gap between some of the social challenges um, and the medical care that we provide. And so she helps parents to navigate through obtaining health insurance. She helps them to coordinate transportation to our clinic. Um, and she helps with some of the social challenges that children with birth defects face in their social lives and in their educational settings. So I've talked a lot about cleft lip and cleft palate, and you may or may not be familiar with what that actually is. Um, a cleft is a birth defect that occurs in utero somewhere between five and 12 weeks of gestation and basically what it is is a failure of the union of the right and left side of the mouth, the palate, the lip, and or the nose to fuse together into one continuous piece. And it can affect just the lip, just the palate, or some combination of all of it. And clefts can be unilateral, one-sided, or bilateral, meaning that they're two-sided. We're often able to diagnose cleft lip in utero. Um, this is an image of a baby at probably about 20 weeks of gestation. And if you look just underneath the nose, you see that there's a definite separation between the right and left side of that child's lip. What happens when the ultrasound identifies this is that the families are told, the families are counseled, and then their perinatal doctor will refer that family to our clinic. And at that point in time, mom and dad probably have a whole lot of questions in terms of what that is going to mean for the way that their child's life will unfold as they grow. Um, so during that initial visit with our clinic, the baby is still in mom's tummy um, and we're able to provide help with our social worker. And then also another key member of our team involved in this process is our feeding specialist. And our feeding specialist is a very specific type of speech and language pathologist. And she'll work with the mom and dad to teach them how to feed their baby. So if you think about a cleft, it's obviously a, a sizable gap. And so when a baby wants to nurse for the first time, that baby's unable to create suction in order to express milk from his or her mother. And so before we were able to treat cleft lip and cleft palate, many of these babies actually died because of failure to thrive. They weren't getting the appropriate nutrition. Um, but because we can identify this early or at the time of birth, we're able to get these kids into immediate specialized care so that they can grow and thrive 
until the point at which they can have surgical and other corrective treatment to address the cleft. So it's a long journey. Um, I know a lot of us think about organizations like Operation Smile or Smile Train, and you see these really dramatic before and after pictures of children who have a cleft lip or cleft palate repair. And it, it's unbelievable what they look like before and after. But what those pictures don't tell you is that that journey is not just a single surgery or two surgeries. That journey can actually last up to 20 years. So again, we initially um, interact with these families to talk about feeding support. Um, once the baby is born, a specialized pediatrician will get involved to make sure that the baby is growing and developing properly and hitting their developmental milestones. Our nursing team is actively involved. And then the other thing that a cleft does is it very profoundly affects the way that a child can hear and the, uh, the way that a child is able to speak. Um, so the way that we speak is that our tongue and the roof of our mouth come together to make certain sounds. And that works in conjunction with our lips, all while there's airflow in and out of our mouth and our nose. If you have a hole in any part of that system, speech can often be unintelligible or very difficult to understand. And so that's where our speech pathology team and our ENT doctors come into play. Um, children born with a cleft are much more likely to have dental problems. They're four to five times more likely to have cavities. So that's my role on the team to help, number one, prevent that, and then number two, treat it if and when it does happen. Um, and then as children grow, there are obviously psychological concerns in terms of dealing with facial differences. Um, and then once a child reaches later um, years in their development, that's when we will connect them with our orthodontist to straighten the teeth and to make sure that their jaws are functioning properly. And then eventually in early adulthood, we'll connect them with a prosthodontist who is a specialized dentist to who will replace missing teeth or deformed teeth. This is a picture from the 1950s of our team. Um, I love this historical photo. So our, our team actually started out in the home of the gentleman that you see sitting down in the middle. His name is Herbert Cooper, and he was an orthodontist who opened up the first orthodontic clinic in Lancaster City back in 1921. From there, he began to volunteer with a hospital that no longer exists, but was in Elizabethtown called the Hospital for Crippled Children. And at that hospital, he encountered many children, again, who had cleft lip and cleft palate. And what he realized was that as an orthodontist, he was very under-equipped to take care of these children on his own. And so what he did was to compile a team of other specialists who dealt with issues of the head and neck, and together, they put together the first cleft palate team that you see here. Since that first clef, clef palate team developed, that concept has been applied across the United States and nationwide. And in the US now, we have about 200 clef palate teams. And nationwide, we have, or I'm sorry, worldwide, we have thousands. And this is what our team looks like now. I think the biggest change, you know, in addition to colored photography, the fact that you see that our team is very heavily dominated by women, and I'm very proud of that. And so we have a joke at our office that the men are underrepresented, um, so we're always welcoming new men to our team. Uh, the man that you see toward the middle of that picture is Rusty Long. Um, he is in a plaid button-down short sleeve shirt. Rusty is actually the grandson of Herbert Cooper, and so there's a very strong family heritage in our particular facility. And, you know, that family tradition is one that we hold very dearly and that we want to carry on into the future. Um, unfortunately, Rusty ran out of dentists in the family. So he's the last orthodontist. Um, but when he stepped down as executive director, he passed the baton to me. Um, but again, we're very honored to have his family heritage as part of our, um, our mission at the clinic. So these are some of our patients. Um, these babies were born with a unilateral or one-sided cleft lip and palate. And as you can see, that affected not only the lip, but the structure and support of the nose. 
So they have a bit of an asymmetry um, and then their palates are open as well. So their mouths are in direct communication with their nose. These are the same babies, a little bit older after their surgical repair. Um, so at first glance, they look absolutely phenomenal. But again, I think the biggest thing to remember about their journey is that they're still in the very, very early stages and they have a significant number of barriers that they need to overcome in order to, to achieve their final result once they hit their late teenage years and early 20s. This little guy was born with a bilateral or two-sided cleft lip and palate. Um, he's crying in the first picture, um, so it looks a little bit wider than it actually is. The middle image that you see of this little guy is of um, what we call infant orthopedic tape. So he actually has a piece of stretchy tape that is attached to each, each of his cheeks, his lip, and then um, the segment of gum tissue that will eventually hold his teeth. And just with that piece of tape, it brings the pieces of the face in much better approximation. So that middle picture is pre-surgical. And then the final picture that you see on the right-hand side is of the same baby after he's had his lip repair surgery. As I mentioned earlier, we also take care of patients who are born with craniofacial differences um, that can result from either disease or genetic conditions. So this young lady has something called Cruzon syndrome. And one of the most dramatic um, facial features of Cruzon syndrome is a middle face or mid face deficiency. So when you look at her in profile, she looks to have a very prominent forehead and a very retruded or small mid face. Another feature is that her eyes look very prominent, almost as if they're coming out of the socket. In reality, her eyes are exactly where they're supposed to be, but the bony structure is so deficient um, that, again, her eyes look quite prominent. And so with growth, um, that can become more and more dramatic over time. And we have some patients for whom that eye um, Prominence is so dramatic that those children can't close their eyelids over the eyes, and so they end up with corneal abrasions, eye dryness, and eventually blindness. So this young lady obviously went through a tremendous number of procedures, extensive dental work, and so on. And on the right-hand side, you can see her final profile after surgical repair and after orthodontics. So she almost looks like a completely different person, but just a stunning um, very aesthetic and functional results. This is her mouth. Um, so the upper left-hand picture is of her pre-orthodontic care and pre-surgical care. The braces on the right-hand side did a tremendous job of lining up the teeth and making them nice and straight. But what braces can't do is to fi fix the jaw deformity. And so at the time that she had a mid-face surgical correction, her upper jaw was actually down fractured and then replated into place so that her upper teeth and her bottom teeth would fit together properly. And then this young man, he is currently in his second year of college. He was born with a bilateral cleft lip and palate. And in the upper left-hand side, if you look at the first profile picture, that is of him um, before a procedure called distraction. So as a result of his cleft, he had such a small upper jaw that it didn't provide enough support for his lip and for his nose. And so he had a procedure with one of our surgeons where his upper jaw was down fractured or actually separated from his skull. And if you look at that lower picture, you can see what are called distractors which are internal surgical devices to actually grow his upper jaw forward, almost like an expander. So over time, he had a key. and Little by little, he would move his jaw forward a millimeter or so each day. And then once his upper jaw was in the proper place, 
those distractors were left into place while the jawbone healed. And then over the course of several weeks, that bone solidified. And then he underwent a second surgical procedure where the surgeon went back in and removed those distractors. Um, and then now he is at the point where he's finished all of his orthodontic care, all of his surgical care, and then his final stage of treatment will involve the replacement and the, um, again, he'll work with a prosthodontist to replace some of the missing teeth that he had as a result of his cleft. What I love about his story is that he is inspired to go into plastic surgery as a result of the life experience that he had uh, being born with a cleft lip and palate. And I have to say that knowing what our patients have gone through and what they have achieved despite their life challenges is just is unbelievably touching. And to be a part of that journey is so fulfilling. So this is another one of our patients graduating from his 18 year journey. He's holding his baby picture, obviously pre-surgical because you can still see his cleft lip and cleft palate. And then the picture of him with his cap and gown is of his high school graduation. Um, and I, again, unbelievably touching and uh, it's an honor to take care of our patients. All right, I'm going to close the presentation and hopefully if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And again, please bear with me because I'm having some technical challenges. Thanks everyone.